Welcome to this video on planetary migration and more specifically in this video we're going to look at planetary migration in a disk. These disks are orbiting stars and there's a few different types of migration in a disk for planets and we're going to look at type 1 in this particular video. So it's worth noting that planets do not stay on an orbit. So planets mostly orbit stars. There are a few odd cases where they don't orbit stars at all. But mostly planets orbit stars and they don't remain on the same orbit, orbit forever. That They can wander around. And we're going to have a look at that inward and outward migration when it's located in a disk, which is typically during the formation process as they're forming around a star. So they do move around and they do wander. So where it all starts stars form from the collapse of gas clouds. So you have these large gas clouds which collapse under their own gravitational forces. They then form a star at the centre. So they collapse enough that they're heated at the centre in their core to start hydrogen fusion. And that's that then gives us a star. But around those young stars, as they're still forming, you have these gas disks. So these are a few images of disks orbiting stars. And that's where the planets form. So planets are going to form in these disks as the stars are still forming. And it's in this disk where you get this planetary migration for the type 1, 2 and 3, which we're going to have a look at. Now, some rogue planets actually might not form that way. So if you want to find out what rogue planets are, I've done a few of our videos on those. But these are planets that are orbiting. Well, they're not orbiting, actually. They are floating in space not orbiting stars so they don't have stars basically but they can form possibly from the collapse of a smaller cloud that's not big enough to form a star but if you want to find out more about those you can check out some of the other videos on rogue planets now during the formation process they form in these gas disks and they can move in it so you've got a planet that's forming in that disk it's accreting material so basically it's growing it's You've got um, material falling onto it, so over time it's growing, it's taking matter from that disk, and it's obviously orbiting in the disk as well. And during that process, it can move inwards, it can move outwards. So that's what we're going to have a look at. Now, this process can explain why some planets are quite close to their stars. So, for example, hot Jupiters, they actually can't form where we find them. So they're too close to their planet, and they're too big. There's not enough material or mass in the disk whilst the star is forming to basically grow such a large planet so things like hot jupiters they can't grow where they are so they have to have migrated from somewhere else in the disk and this process can account for that um, most of the time so there's three main types of migration in a disk around a star so you've got type one which is the one we're going to have a look at for this video you've got type two and then type three. So type two is where you have a gap. So there's a planet located in a gap in this disk. And type three is kind of like type one, but they, they're interacting with um, vortices in the disk because it's a gas disk and they can be turbulent and you can have vortices in there and it can obviously alter the way they migrate. But for this video, let's have a look at type one. So type one concerns small terrestrial planets and they will migrate in the disk due to type 1. So these are small planets, a bit like Earth, Mars, I've given an example there, that sort of size. So as they're growing, they're, they're going to get to a point where they're no longer type 1 migration. But it's typically smaller terrestrial planets for type 1. Now these are not big enough to gravitationally clear out a gap. So they're small enough to kind of be embedded in the disk without significantly altering the structure. So they can sit there, but they don't have enough mass or they don't gravitationally interact with the disk enough to distort it to cause a gap or clear it out. So that's the, the key defining feature of type 1. Now, when they're, they are in the disk, they do create these spiral density waves. So if it's in the disk, it's a gas disk, remember, you have an inner spiral density wave and an outer spiral density wave. And this is caused from the gravitational interaction between the disk and the planet. The planet causes these kind of um, waves on the inner part and outer part. And these actually exert a torque back on the planet. So whilst the planet is distorting the disk, the disk obviously exerts a, an opposing force as well on the planet. And that can actually change its angular momentum. 
So this is where the migration actually comes from. So the outer spiral wave is going to exert a greater torque than the inner one. Now you can have a look at the actual the simulation here where they've run a simulation of a planet embedded in the gas disk orbiting a star at the centre. And you can see that the outer spiral density wave is larger than the inner one. Now that means you've got a, um, an asymmetry in the amount of force those inner and outer spiral waves are exerting on the planet. So what that means is that the planet loses angular momentum and then it migrates inwards towards the star. So for type 1, you generally find that you get an inward migration of the planet because there's an imbalance in the inner and outer spiral density wave and it will nearly always cause an inward migration. I mean, there might be some special cases if it's located quite far out in the disk, so more towards the edge, but normally type 1, you get inward migration of the planet because of that imbalance. Now, the actual migration rate is proportional to the, the mass of the planet and the local gas density. So, for example, if you had a larger planet, you'd expect it to migrate in faster, things like that. So they're the sort of things which will dictate how fast it's going to migrate inwards. Now, you get a similar spiral density waves caught in Saturn's rings and spiral galaxies. So in Saturn's rings, and I've kind of done a bit of a zoom here, and maybe not as obvious as they would be for the images we saw of the embedded planets, but we have quite a lot of moons orbiting in and outside of Saturn's rings, and they cause spiral density waves which are related to orbital resonances. So for example, if you've got a moon orbiting on the outside of the ring and it orbits once for every two orbits of a ring particle that's a bit closer, then you've got an orbital resonance because they have to be integer ratios of one another. The forcing frequency from the planet, from the moon in this case, is going to be some ratio of its orbital period of a particle in the ring. And it's the same thing that's happening with the planet in the disk, the forcing frequency is some integer ratio kind of of its orbital period, and you get these spiral waves being produced. And again, with spiral galaxies, the arms of a spiral galaxy are caused with a similar sort of mechanism and process, really. So it's down to a well, a resonance in the or ratio of the forcing frequency, which is whatever the object is, so in this case a moon or a planet and the orbit of the material in the disk. So it's just down to mostly orbital resonances. If the object in Saturn's rings is small enough, then you don't get a gap being formed. You get something known as a propeller. So embedded in Saturn's rings, there are objects or little moonlets that are about 100 meter sort of size. They're not big enough to completely distort the ring. So when you get to a certain size, so like tens of kilometres sort of size in Saturn's rings anyway, they can gravitationally clear out a gap a bit similar to type 2 migration. But when they're small enough, it just causes this propeller shape, which is a, a distortion locally around that embedded moonlet. Now, there's no gas in Saturn's rings, but what you find is that you get a similar sort of effect. So when they're small enough, it's almost like type 1. Now, when you transition from type 1 to type 2, it typically happens at around about the size of Saturn. So when planets have grown to the size of Saturn, or thereabouts, it depends kind of on a few other local um, parameters, but it will happen about the size of Saturn. It then starts to clear out a gap in its orbit. And at that point, the migration changes to type 2, and the way it migrates is different. Uh, it's no longer considered as type 1. And we'll consider type 2 in a separate video as well as type 3. So thank you for watching and if you enjoy then you can check out some of the videos.